We get started. Why don't you stand? For your beauty that's been shown For your miracles For the miracles we see Praise you. Forever. 
Ever and ever and ever, ever, ever I'll be praising you. Let go, 
Goodness of God. 
Before even time began, my life was in his hands. Sing that again. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hands. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear.
and we praise your name.
You are awesome, Lord. of all things. We thank you, Lord, for your love and for your grace, for your mercy. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your precious Holy Spirit that lives in us. Thank you for life. Worship you. Lord, thank you for your sovereign hand. You are sovereign. We trust you in all things. You reign. I do need to make an announcement. Um, so what would that have been? Our last meeting in May is was the, the eighth. no, it is the, I thought it is the 8th. No, it, no. Are you sure? Let me check that out. She may be right. Let's get it straight here. Well, I don't trust anybody. <laughs> I only trust what we wrote down. <laughs> uh, it's still on the eighth, but that's uh, yeah. But, yeah. So the first is the last meeting, and we will be going on the eighth. So yeah. So my uh, son's coming home on a night. Uh, well, uh, Friday. Yeah, I don't know how long he's here, but um, he asked me to help him shop for a car because he has no transportation. He got him alone, you know, and um, so we're going to buy him a car, and then that week is the only week I can come up with that I can drive it to him. So I'm making a road trip to see his place and uh, go visit him on that week. So, so our last gathering will be... Uh, the first, so that means we got tonight and then two more lessons, basically, and um, and then we'll break for the, we'll, huh? Yeah, we have different. We do like a once a month thing in the summer, uh, multicultural dinner. That's been kind of fun. Um, we are looking at possibly on July, instead of the June, July, and August, we'll just do one in July. Um, a f kind of a freedom night, uh, celebrating freedom. And that's going to be somewhere around, the, what would we say, the 20th or somewhere in there? Because June, June we have the Freedom Day. Yeah. 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 No, you're doing a game night. The game night's July and the Freedom Night's in August. No, I didn't say August. Okay, then it's July. But so we that, that I know I'm right on. <laughs> you can do the game night. Just, um, this, that's, I think... Uh, and we can talk about it later, yeah. but um, the game night was the 10th, and I was talking about doing it on the 24th. Oh, the same month. Okay. Yeah, same month, right. but not the same night. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and just just um, kind of a, not just church-wide, but community-wide, just open up the doors, and man, let's kind of address the issues of the day, and worship together, and pray together, and uh, be encouraged and inspired, and take a stand for uh, your liberty. Amen? Amen. Hello. And, uh, which is, yeah, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. You know, if our, if our sons and daughters are willing to go shed their blood on foreign land for our liberty, we ought to be able to put up with a little bit of shame or insults or whatever to stand up for liberty here. So that's just kind of how I feel about it. And so there you go. I'm waiting for this to open. Here we go. All right. I did a little spin off of, uh, I don't know if you got, they got my graphic back there or not, but I did a little spit off of, uh, you got it. You're looking at it, so never mind. Uh, it's to the twilight zone. We're stepping into the sovereign zone. <laughs> don't ask me. Some of these weird things hit my brain. I, 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 yeah, I was hearing. Uh, <laughs> and then trying to find the right font. I never did. I just had to settle for that one. But nonetheless, there it is. Step into the sovereign zone. Last week it was Christ alone. Romans 8. My... I would say one of my favorite chapters out of the Bible, and it really is, it, it's as we started Romans 1 and making our way through the chapters, you get to Romans 8, it's like, it's like a crescendo, it's just building, you get to the end of chapter 8 and it's like the symbols are crashing and all, everything's blowing, right, it's just a, this massive crescendo theologically, it's just incredible chapter and giving us confidence who we are in Christ and how sovereign God is and nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we looked at how he persevered the Holy Spirit interceding for us. He's filling in for our weakness and our deficiency when we don't even know what to pray. And the ultimate goal is the completion of our salvation, that we would be glorified, not just justified, but glorified. That we are as he is and that we're without sin and that sin nature any longer. We are equipped and transformed to live with him forever, in whatever that looks like. Amen? <laughs> so all of this truth, you know, said in the context of God's elect, we touched on that just a little bit, God's predestination, the idea that God calls us, has purpose for us, his plans cannot be thwarted. Uh, God is the one that brings us home, if, and, and, and if that is true, then what happened with the nation of Israel? And that's the question that Paul's now having to address and as he moves into chapter 9, 10, and 11. What's happened here? You know, Israel historically has been called God's sons, the children of Israel, uh, the children of God, and they've experienced the, the Shekinah glory of God historically, the recipients of the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, recipients of the Ten Commandments, the privilege with the experience of temple worship, the only temple of God in the earth where sacrifices were made, where this sacrificial land was yearly offered, Israel, lineage, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, David, Elijah, Elisha. You know, it's incredible history that we have recorded in the Word of God, right? And um, Paul now has to prove that what God has done in regards to the gospel isn't inconsistent with his word, that God cannot lie. And that there's harmony and consistency with the promise of God to Israel and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the outcome that Paul argues is that the gospel does not negate those promises, but affirms God's intended plan all through the Old Testament and now revealed through Christ. I mean, everything. We're, we're, what, when are we having the, uh, uh, the Seder? That's coming up. 25th. I would encourage you, if you've never been, you need to come. It's just incredible. Yeah, bring your kids. Uh, we need to really push that Sunday because I, I really wanted that last year to try to get kids there you know, because everything in that is a picture of Christ. You know, and, and just as you do a, a study of the tabernacle, the, the, the one, the tent out there in the wilderness, everything about it in its construction, the materials, everything about it, a portrait of Christ. So this is... Yeah, you need to get tickets. You got to sign, sign up in the back, I guess, or what? Sunday. Yeah, Sunday. So, um, so the manner that Paul will defend the harmony between God's promises to Israel and the gospel of Christ is he begins to define Israel, right? But it's not as though the word of God has failed, he says, but they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And he addresses the issue of uh, by historical example. He talks about uh, Abraham's descendants. But though Isaac, your descendants, will be named Abraham had two sons, Isaac, Ishmael, but Isaac was the one born of Sarah. Isaac was the one to inherit the promise. 
Then he clarifies details also with, uh, that only one of the two sons is a spiritual descendant, the promised heritage initiated by the Spirit, not by flesh. And in verses 10 through 12, reinforces the same thought. Jacob and Esau, two brothers of the same mother and father, yet one inherits and the other does not. And uh, goes further to note that one was chosen even before they were born. God makes a choice. And that's kind of where he's headed with this, the sovereignty of God, one over the other, before either had a chance to do anything good or bad. And when traditionally the inheritance of blessing would fall into the firstborn, in this case, while in the womb, two nations and the older will serve the younger, God chooses the younger. Bottom line, Paul is desiring to convince the Jews of the truth of the gospel. And then he makes this plea. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, um, there were this hurting deeply in anguish, great pain for the spiritual well-being of his kinsmen. And that's really the purpose of these chapters that are, that are coming up here, to make a compelling case to the Jew to believe and be saved. And he wants to convince the Jews that they've, been, they've not been disherited or replaced, but that the gospel is a fulfillment of that history of salvation that they've been a part of. So verse 2, that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. And I tell you, that, that passage has just screamed at me <laughs> since I studied that you know, last week. And uh, the entire passage with this Extreme statement that Paul sees his kinsmen of being outside of the saving grace of God through their unbelief, rejection of Jesus. And Paul is so passionate about his cause, he's willing to become even accursed if it meant they were saved. So the gospel is fully inclusive, amen, in that God would that all would be saved. The gospel is equally exclusive in that Jesus is the only means of obtaining that salvation. And so uh, we, may we anguish as Paul did for our kinsmen to know uh, God through Christ. So Romans 9, verse 14. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, and this is scripture saying to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth, so that he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Wow. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does, this, or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? And it's going to go on and say some more, but this is all the time we got to look at right here. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm going to, we're, we're stepping into the sovereign zone here. That's, we really are. And I'm going to say some things, and I have said them, Historically from the pulpit, I don't know that it always penetrates <laughs> because it sounds a little too tough, a little too harsh maybe. Um, but the truth is, this subject, there is, and I wrote in my mind and experience, this is just me speaking, in my mind and in my own experience, there is no more of a stirring, dividing, controversial subject to step into than to begin attempting to understand who God saves and who God will reject. Right, that can be a very hot topic, um, and there are some people that think they're expert on that subject <laughs> as to who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. Right? Um, you know, I've, I certainly have seen some people, and by their behavior and the fruit that they are exhibiting, that hey, if you don't change your ways, you might wind up. I don't know though, right? But you can say it looks like you're headed that way, right? But I was listening to an interview today, actually, and I didn't have time to listen to all of it, but I got into the beginning of it. It was like a, um, one of the, those podcasts, Dr. Michael Brown, and he's a theologian, Messianic Jew, an apologist. He's a brilliant writer. He's an incredible debater, um, very humble, in my opinion, um, in that process. I've seen him 
sit down in some very tense situations and just hand it so dispassionately, but yet also compassionately towards them. And uh, just have a lot of respect for him. And um, I've actually written him before and just asking his permission to use some of his material. And, uh, and I said, you know, use whatever you want, right? But he comes from a Pentecostal background, fully believes in the gifts and the continued operations of spiritual gifts in the world today. Yet he's grounded solidly in the world, meaning he ain't, I don't even, if I, I didn't spell that right, whatever, how you ever spell flaky? I don't know if that's right or not. It looks funny to me as I look at it, but uh, in, in that understanding of gifts, he's not flaky. He's not, you know, because charismatics, let's be honest, can get really flaky. And by saying flaky, uh, doing things and practicing things that scripture didn't say and presenting things that God didn't really say, you know, thus saith the Lord when God didn't say thus, right? <laughs> that, that can be a flaky environment, I'm just saying. And he holds that accountable, right, really well. And, uh, but he understands the gifts. He's actually in that environment with those guys, rubbed shoulders with a lot of those guys. He's written personal letters, had conversations one-on-one -on -one with very spiritual leaders, even bringing correction. And uh, he's the one that, that I, had, I, I was using this term, honestly, because I didn't know what else to call it, hyper grace. And, um, and, and this was the, the last time... Um, What's the prophet guy that we had in that passed away? Uh, no. Um, no. No, the young guy, um, younger guy. John Paul Jackson. And uh, John Paul Jackson ministered here after church. We went to, um, out to eat, and I was chatting with him, and I was just at that particular time just kind of uncovering a lot of bad teaching going on out there and having to deal with some of it here honestly, and, um, and I was sitting next to him, so I'm kind of whispering to him, you know, my thoughts, and I actually thought, well, because sometimes I'll just take a chance, I'm just going to throw my heart out there and see, see where it goes, and he can rebuke me, right, but we were in full agreement, and he's the one that told me, he said, Mike, uh, Dr. Michael Brown's about to come up with a, out with a book called Hyper Grace, you're going to want to get it, because it's exactly what you're talking about, and um, so he wrote that, and I will tell you, as he wrote that, uh, I could name you some of the pastors that he confronts in that book. But here's what he did. He didn't write a, a book just to blast them. He actually called them. He actually tried to set up meetings with every one of them to discuss their position on grace and to talk through these differences. Only one out of, I don't know how many, only one accepted that invitation. The rest of them declined. Didn't want anything to do with it. And... Um, um, so just, just a solid guy. So I'm watching this podcast today, and as he's beginning this podcast, there's a guy that calls in, and he's rebuking Dr. Michael Brown for having appeared on Benny Hinn's, I guess, TBN show or whatever. And because um, he's saying he's a charlatan, and he's this, and he's that, and, and basically, you know, implying some very serious things towards Benny Hinn. And I'll tell you what, Benny Hinn has been in a lot of era, Absolutely. a lot. But I will tell you, he has taken correction from people. Um, and Michael Brown's one of them that's gone and corrected him before. And um, so this guy is basically saying, well, Benny Hinn's going to hell. And he's starting naming some other. He's going to hell too, right? And Michael Brown's like, well, how do you know who's going to hell and who's not going to hell? What, what, what blinders you have on? This was an interesting little conversation to listen to, right? And, um, but there's people that think that way. A lot of it's out there. There's some guys, some pastors I, I really love to listen to that are, would be um, um, cessationist, meaning they believe that the gifts, uh, as we know it and we see it functioning in the, the first hundred years of the church until the apostles died out, that those things ceased back then. And, you know, that basically God doesn't speak to you. The only way you, God will speak is if you read the Bible out loud, now God's speaking to you. I've heard them literally say that. And then some of them, incredible teachers on certain subjects, you just have to watch it. But I'm just saying, I believe they're brothers, really do. But they got blind spots, right? Yeah. And, and would turn around and say that of another brother. Well, because I, I remember when I got saved, I thought Baptists were Baptists. I had no idea there were so many different kinds of Baptists, right? I grew up Southern Baptist, just even within Southern Baptists, right? 
Because in Southern Baptists, particularly 70s and 80s, there was three divisions. You had, you had moderates, you had conservatives, and you had liberals, right? And I probably have to say I grew up in a probably what would be considered a moderate Baptist, Southern Baptist church, meaning we didn't talk about tongues being bad and we didn't talk about this being bad. We just talked about the cross and Jesus crucified, right? The gospel. That's all it was, right? I didn't know anything different. My, matter of fact, my family sang gospel music. We sang in full gospel businessmen fellowships. We sang in Pentecostal church. We sang all over the place. We saw people slaying the spirit. And though we didn't fully understand it, we didn't, we didn't uh, um, you know, say they were demonic or whatever. We just, we're going to respect that, right? Even though we don't fully understand it. But, but we know these are brothers in the Lord. And, um, um, and, and so... I, I, I started looking for a church. I'd just gotten saved. I'm 19 years old. Just gotten saved. Started working for the prison. Moved to Huntsville. So I'm looking for a church. And I started visiting Baptist churches. And I wound up at this little Baptist church outside of Huntsville. Uh, a couple miles outside of it. Fairly new building though. A um, little under 200 people. And the pastor taught the adult Sunday school. And then he preached. And you'd go cover to cover in that Bible. And... Um, um, I thought, this is where I've got to be. But after I was there for a little bit, I started finding out, well, he'd, he'd divide us up in groups. Now, y'all are going to study tongues. And when we're studying tongues, we're studying why it's demonic. And you're not a Christian if you speak in it. That kind of stuff. You're like, whoa, wait a minute. You know? And I'll, I, it's a long story. Can't elaborate on But God wound up writing Ichabod on that church, right? And um, it wound up shutting down. And... Um, Last, about 10 years ago, I was driving in for men's prayer, and the Lord said to me, driving in early in the morning for men's prayer, about 5.30, 5.15 in the morning, he said, um, I want you to think of every person you've served under um, that's been a, a, an authority over you, whether it's a boss at a secular job or a pastor you served under. I want you to list them, and what did you, because, you know, you're not under people for nothing, right? All things, God's sovereign, and when you're under those people, God puts you there, I truly believe, to impart some things to you. That I will tell you, Bob Nix, who I served under, there's a little Bob Nix that's been imparted to me. I served under Curry for 11 years. There's, a, there's some of Curry that's been imparted into me. And, I, and so I'm going through this list, and the first one I'm thinking of is this pastor of that church. And I think, well, I know that one. That one's what not to do, right? <laughs> and the Lord kind of popped me upside the head and said, no, 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 no. Think again. And I had to think about it and realized, despite his faults and his blindness, he actually imparted great things in my life, especially for digging into the Word. Because when I would come in, on Wednesday nights, we'd walk in there and uh, he'd say, okay, you four guys, y'all sit here. You women sit here. And you're going to study like, like tongues, whatever. You guys, you're going to study church discipline and in six weeks, you're going to present a teaching to the church. And out of that group, nobody did any work but me. Six weeks later, I presented a, a teaching. I had never done in scriptures like that before in my life. We'd walk in, and he'd have uh, all the eight-foot tables in one single line with chairs on each side. And he'd, you go over here, you go over here, you go over here, you go over there. He'd put all the baby Christians on one side, all the mature Christians on the other side. And he said, okay, for the next eight weeks, you guys are going to defend creation. And for the next eight weeks, you guys are going to play the devil's advocate and defend uh, evolution. And making those mature Christians, you know, dog us. And they'd eat our lunch, you know, and I'd go, I'd, we'd go home mad and, and, and digging and try to come back with something to rebuttal, you know, those things. And, and just learning and digging and basically forming apologetics in us, right? And, um, and so I'm like, Lord, you're right. I can't look at him and define him by those, those worst things. I'm going to define him by those good things that he imparted to my life. And that's kind of, I think, the problem here is that we... We start defining people by what we don't agree with and blah, 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 when there's so many good things uh, uh, in each other. Um, knowing, it, knowing one another according to the spirits, to the flesh, right? Um, so it becomes a very touchy subject. And there are false teachers in modern Christianity, right? Um, um, there's, there's mega churches, and I have a real problem with this, and I'm probably less... Um, conciliatory or, or less, uh, not so friendly when you start saying there is no hell, right? And there's, there's pastors, I keep telling you, I think it's called the American Gospel 
Christ alone. Uh, I've got it on Prime Video. It's over two hours interviewing pastors on both sides of the fence. And there is a lot of mega pastors that don't believe that there's a hell. They don't believe that Jesus had to be the substitution of the Lamb of God. Well, that's heresy, right? That's a whole different matter. Um, point is, what happens is we get arrogant. <laughs> Arrogance. There's arrogance among the created, assuming to have better judgment than the Creator, when we ain't got a clue. When the foreknowledge of who is saved and who perishes, we have no knowledge of that. That's God's business, not ours. Verse 16 says, So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Verse 18, So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Verse 20, on the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel or honorable use and another for common use? So one of the popular topics floating around the Christian community some while back was this attempt to answer this commonly posed question. Not prosed, that was a mis misspell there. If God is a loving God then why does bad things happen to good people, right? That was kind of, a, kind of a popular topic to try to address about, I don't know, eight, nine years ago. Um, and, and I always find it interesting to watch people twist and turn and spin trying to answer that question, but there's only one true answer to that question. And I have said this historically from the pulpit, and I would just say to you, brace yourself like a man, None of your business. Absolutely none of your business. We are but clay. He's the master creator. We're mud. <laughs> We're mud in his hands, right? And whatever he molds us into, or if he reduces us back to mud, that's his business. Yeah. You ever seen that? A person doing pottery and you know, not liking what they got? And it's just back to a blob of mud. God can do whatever he chooses to. It's his business, none of ours. We truly are at the mercy of God. We don't like to hear that, but that truly is the right answer. Or else you have to elevate into the sovereign zone as if you, as if you know the mind of God. See, we get that knowledge piecemeal. We have to constantly pray. Our Father who art in heaven, right? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Holy Spirit's having to intercede in our deficiency, right? Because we, we, we don't even know what to pray. Why? Because we're clay. We're clay. And here's a very hard pill to swallow as we read this. Paul doesn't even offer us a notion that God's selection of human beings for salvation even fits within the choosing of those individuals of God through faith. He doesn't say that here. Paul makes a very hard, closed statement that God chooses or has mercy on those that he wants to and that he even hardens the hearts of those that he wants to. Wow. And it's a very hard position. But as people ponder those questions, people make judgments about God. You ever heard this? I mean, that's what this, if you watch that video I was telling you about, uh, the modern gospel, Christ alone, and those who are editing God, that's where I got that idea for a series called Editing God, because they're editing God, they're editing the Word of God, they're discounting it, and they're making up their own ideal about God. And they'll ask questions, well, if God is such a loving God, right, how could He? And you fill in the blank, because you've heard that question. How could He let people go to hell? You might have seen recently... Uh, um, um, what's his name? Um, uh, no, uh, Carlton Pearson passed away. Carlton Pierce, right? Pearson, he, 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 uh, he flipped out. He was like the upcoming shining star in Christian, you know, Christian evangelist, uh, um, and uh, just flipped out that there's no hell. People aren't going to hell and turn into universalism and, you know, inclusive theology. Everybody's going to heaven whether they know it or not. And, you know, in his church on the stained glass window, there's Jesus up there and Hitler's bound down at his feet, you know, on the stained glass window. You're like, you got to be kidding, right? 
um, he just flipped out. We say, well, God is God of love, right? How could he punish people, right? <laughs> you know, how could he have this? If he's a God of love, how could he have this? Serve me or I'm going to obliterate you, you know? Um, this perspective made of God is that he's immoral. That's what's being implied, that, that God's immoral to be that way. But the problem is the standard to judge God is nothing less than God himself, right? Who can judge God? <laughs> Nobody, right? <laughs> you know, you ever say if somebody judges you, you say, well, buddy, you walk in my shoes for a day, right? Ain't nobody ever walk in God's shoes. The, the standard to judge God is God. Nobody can stand in that position and judge him. Who stands qualified for that task? God is the only true God. God can only be judged by God. He's the standard. Paul begins addressing this question of God's morality and addressing the fact that God is just. Verse 14, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? And of course, here he is again. May it never be. Of course not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And this reverence of Moses is truly unique. It's a unique moment in the history of man, this reference that he's making. It's drawing from Ex Exodus 33. Um, I mean, think of it. What Moses is about to experience, no man on the planet ever has experienced. This is an incredible moment. The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I've known you by name. That's why we sang that song. He knows our name, right? Because he's, he's wanting to see God's glory. And then Moses said, I pray you show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. So Moses, already having had some pretty spectacular encounters with God, but here he's asking for an even greater experience and encounter with the presence of God, and God responds and says, you have found favor in my sight, I know your name. And then suddenly we see a certain attribute of God through this one statement that, that I, you've found favor in my sight and I know your name. All of a sudden, we see an attribute of God. We see how intimate he is. We see how passionate God is. God can do anything. Nothing's impossible to him, right? He is the copyright owner of <laughs> instinctual property. Well, I don't know what that is intellectual property is what that's supposed to be. Spell check does not always work out as your friend, right? Didn't catch that one. Yeah. Copyright owner of the intellectual property. Did you understand the creation recorded in Genesis is God being creative in the earth and everything it contains is his intellectual property. Hello? We don't think of it in those terms. It came out of his mind, his heart, and he spoke it into being. He published it. <laughs> right? You know, when, when you write a song and I make a recording, or if I just sing it in public, if I, if I wrote a song this week, come here next Sunday, and I sing the song in public, that's published. That's published. And, you know, and I'm going to get ahead of myself. Well, I'll wait to explain copyright. But God owns the intellectual property of the earth and all that it contains. That includes us. He could have reduced it to ashes if he wanted to. He could have melted it all down and started all over. But here we see God reaching out to man, just like you see the beginning of, in Genesis, the beginning of the fall, God reaching out to man. God who can do anything he wishes is bestowing mercy on a man, and he tells Moses, I will make my goodness pass before you. I will expose you to some of who I am. He can't get all of it because it'll kill him. But I will allow you to behold some of my attributes of, of my being and my character. And God says, I show mercy to whom I wish to, and I will also show my compassion and my graciousness to whomever I wish to. <laughs> so this incident that Paul references in chapter 9 it's striking a, a chord to the listener, especially the Jewish 
listener because they're going to connect that to Moses and what happened there, that God is creator of all things. He can destroy both body and soul, and yet God is gracious and God is compassionate, and God is even willing to hear the request of one man and respond in revealing his goodness to him. How beautiful that is, right? So once again, the question Paul's addressing is that some may suggest that God is unfair and that he picks some and he rejects others. I did tell you some time back, most people in the scope of the history of humanity perish. Most go to hell. Or else Jesus was mistaken when he said, there are few that find it. It's a narrow road and few find it. But the, this road over here is broad and many find that road to destruction. So the dilemma is that many perish, few find salvation. And when we think of that, you put that in terms, especially if you talk to somebody that's not even spiritual minded, you begin to try to tell them that, they're going to look at that and say, God's being unfair. <laughs> and Paul's saying, may it never be. He's certainly not. Because here's part of the problem. God is the author of salvation. It comes from him. We are the authors of damnation, not God. Hello? Uh, last time I checked, that's our handiwork. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Mercy is undeserved favor. You can't earn it. There's no way to deserve it. And everyone in the earth is not owed mercy or salvation. Hello? See, there's like even an entitlement in Christianity, like everybody's owed salvation. You're not owed salvation. You can't even earn it. It's a free gift, actually, right? And there's none righteous, not even one. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God and his goodness. And I just want to kind of clarify what I'm trying to say here. Hopefully this will do it for you. It might help. But, you know, I've heard this said in many organizations. They'll make a statement, well, we can't do that for you. Because if we do that for you, if we do this for one, we have to do it for everybody. As if there's some policy of fairness that we have to hold to. That if by helping one person, we're now obligated to help and assist everyone. And that's nonsense. You do for one what you might like to do for everybody. But quite frankly, I'm completely comfortable helping one person knowing I will not help everyone. The act of compassion is not at all based upon fairness to all, but out of mercy towards one. Hello? Salvation is about God's mercy, not justice or fairness. Mercy. No one deserves it. God was obligated to save no one. If anyone had claim to his mercy, then it is no longer mercy. It's owed. Again, the wages of sin is death, but out of mercy, God has made a way for us to receive grace, a free gift, unmerited, undeserved, one of Paul's examples of showing the sovereignty of God is shifting from Moses to Pharaoh. Pharaoh would not release the children of God, but yet Pharaoh was not acting on his own accord. It clearly states in Scripture that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? God uses Pharaoh for his own purposes in the earth. Scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. But folks, Pharaoh loses, right? <laughs> His mighty army perishes in the Red Sea. God has mercy on whomever he wants, and he hardens the heart of whomever he wants. But I want to be clear, God isn't playing games. So that's the other thing. People say, well, God's just playing games. No, he's not. All of this issuing of mercy and this hardening of hearts, all of it serves one singular purpose, his plan, his will in the earth. See, when God hardened Pharaoh's heart, verse 9 says he did so to what? Demonstrate his power. To proclaim his purpose and name in the earth. See, these things are done in concert with God's plan in the earth. When uh, Pharaoh, uh, was Pharaoh a good fellow that turned bad because God hardened his heart? Not hardly. Pharaoh was a pagan, cruel dictator. He rejected the one true God. God reinforces this already resistant heart of Pharaoh and uses that hardening for his purpose to set his people free from slavery. See, God allowed a heart to be hardened. It isn't God turning that person into something they weren't already. 
<laughs> it's simply giving that person over to where their heart truly already was in the first place. Read Romans 1. That's what a reprobate mind is, right? It's interesting. I want to tell you, uh, here, he's a cessationist, John MacArthur, but uh, he has some interesting stuff out there. And there was a message I was watching, uh, just some bits of it in response to what Biden did on, on Easter and uh, with the proclamation of Transgender Visibility Day and then some of the appointees that he has made. I mean, you've, you right now in Washington have a man that dresses up like a woman showing up in an office that he appointed them to. He's, he's actually had two. One of them is such an idiot. They got, they got charged with stealing luggage at an airport. I don't know if you ever saw that one. Yeah, it was over like uh, energy and nuclear stuff or whatever. He, 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 I'll leave it alone. Um, there's a lot I could say. But I'm just saying, what, what MacArthur was saying, folks, that's a reprobate mind. You don't get back from a reprobate mind. God turns you over to it. And we're in a very serious place as a nation. Uh, God allowed a heart to be hardened. It's not God turning that person into something they weren't. It's, it's simply giving that person over to where their heart truly already was in the first place. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, The world fell into sin, but God put a limit, a restraint upon it. And this world would be complete chaos and hell if he did not do so. I'll just stop there for a minute because we, we've kind of looked at that as we began in Romans. And Paul touched on it a bit because you had that moment of one explicit command in the Garden of Eden. Don't eat of that tree, right? And they broke it. And now you have a period of time leading up to the flood of just depravity. And there's really no explicit command to break. It's men living however they want to. And not until Moses pops on the scene and you, he receives these words from the Lord through a burning bush. And now we have explicit commands of God once again. And I believe that's part of the restraint that he's speaking of. God has always kind of had a hand in the universe and restraining and restraining. That's why I tell people, I don't know how eschatology works out, but I'm going to tell you, at whatever point the church is raptured out, you don't want to be in the earth when that happens when there is no longer a proclaiming prophetic voice in the earth for the gospel and the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church is out. Oh my goodness, hell and chaos is now released on the earth. That's why I do believe that last half is worse than the first, but I'll leave that alone. The world fell into sin, but God put a limit, a restraint upon it, and this world would be complete chaos and hell if he did not do so. But the moment he draws back his restraining influence, at any point, there is hardening. So that is one of the ways in which God produces hardening. He leaves them to themselves. Wow. Verse 20, on the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Will it? It doesn't sound logical, does it? <laughs> or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? This is hard for people to process unless they personalize this. I want to personalize this. Now get back to this idea of copyright, intellectual property. Right? I, I don't know how many songs I've written. I, I quit counting once I started pastoring. And I haven't written a lot since I've been pastoring. So it's, it's over 300, last time I counted. Um, and, you know, some people would jokingly say to me through the years, I sang a song I wrote and they really liked it. They'll come up to me and say, boy, you got that one copywritten? I sure hope you got it copywritten because, you know, I'm going to steal that one from you. I like that one, right? And they're joking, right? But they don't even understand the law when they say that. Because what they're implying is, did you send that off to the Library of Congress? Well, that's not copywriting. Copywriting, your creation is copywritten upon creation. The moment you created it, I can put my name on it, and it's 2024. I can put a C and circle it, and 2024, copywritten upon creation. All I have to do now is prove it. That's what registering in the Library of Congress is. I am establishing proof that I wrote it. But it is my intellectual property 
the moment I wrote it. If, you, if I wrote a song here in the midst of our worship and you walked out and tried to go sell that song as if you wrote it, I can at least prove through a live stream, no, I wrote that, right? And I could take you to court because I own the intellectual property because I created it in that moment and I have proof that I did so. That's, that's God owns the intellectual property of the earth the moment he created it. He owns the copyright of the earth and everything in it, every living thing, including us. And because I own the copyright to those songs, I wrote it, I can, I can do anything I want to to it. I can rearrange it. I can change the melody. I can change the words. I can do whatever I want to to it. It's my intellectual property. I can wad it up and throw it in the trash. You know what? I've done that a couple times. Most songwriters go to songwriter seminars and tell you, don't throw anything away. I'm like, man, if I wake up the next day and I don't like it, why would anybody else like it? I'm throwing it away, right? I'm not keeping it. I'll write something fresh t today, right? But I'm not going to keep something I don't like, right? Because I, I can do that. I, I own that intellectual property. I can wad it up and throw it away. God could do that too. You get the point. God owns the intellectual property of all things. There's nothing that exists that he did not create. So he has full rights, and it is no way unjust. It is in no way unjust in showing mercy to some and withholding from others. We're not God. God sees the hearts of men. So be thankful that our God is compassionate, right? I think one of the most precious things in Genesis is to read where Adam and Eve sinned, that was no secret to God when he called out to Adam. He was compassionate. He was thinking in terms of restoring. He had a redemptive plan even then. And the issue for us is we don't know the hearts of men. And uh, we have to trust God in his judgment. We trust God in his mercy. We trust God in his grace. Our job is to stay humble. I think that's why it's so important, just like we talked about Sunday, that we believe in the Lord Jesus and we love one another. Let's stick to what we know we're supposed to do. And out of those things flows those things that are pleasing to God as we love God and as we love one another. Man, loving with all of our heart, soul, strength, and might. Because God sees it all. No, he knows it all. He, he just said that previously. God is sovereign. And we're not through with this topic. <laughs> He's going to talk about it a little bit more. But I would just say, I don't fully understand election. I don't understand predestination. I, I'm, I, I don't understand all that. I'm, I'm just laying out what I see in Scripture. And as we see, I would say, though, as we see that about Pharaoh, God did not change Pharaoh, right? He just gave him over to what he was, to use him for his purpose. And I believe in his reaching out to, to, to men, that he sees in our heart something that we are, and he, he, he takes that and he issues grace, just as he did with Moses. You, you found favor in my sight, and I'm going to show you my goodness. I'm going to show you my attributes, and I believe that's what he does. That's called grace, <laughs> grace that he would do that. So, Father, we thank you for your incredible grace and your incredible mercy. And, Lord, as we... We don't fully understand it, and how could we? We are the created, and you are the creator. But we thank you, Lord, even in our deficiency of understanding, what we can do is believe and trust that you are who you say you are. And, Lord, we certainly have evidence as you have intervened in our life with grace and with mercy, looking out for us. You've never forsaken us. You are with us always. You look out for us. We can historically look at our path and see your hand upon us over and over and over again. We thank you. We praise you. And Lord, we worship you. We trust you in all things. You are sovereign. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's nothing that escapes you. And Lord, that we would really just set our hearts to the simplicity of what the gospel really has set forth for us, that we would love you. We would trust you. We, we would believe in you and uh, give our lives to you. 
and that we would also give our lives to one another, that we would love one another. And out of those things flows all of these things that please you. You create community. You even create testimony and that others will even know who we are. They know us, but that we're your disciples because of our love. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Let's pray. We've got about 15 minutes or so, 15, 20.